All right, Tim Overton. So I want to touch on several, I think, very important topics here and issues that you've got a background in as uh, someone who teaches bias training, somebody who is a member of the church. And uh, uh, I want to go through things that are a little bit sensitive. You know, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement right now, diversity and inclusion, critical theory, race and the law. And, and, of course, how all these things might fit in with, with the gospel and, and, and how, do we, how do we look at race relations um, within the church. But I want to start off in talking about your bias training. I had, I had pulled up a little bit of, well, some videos that you did. I believe it was to your, to your law firm. You talked about, uh, you know, we all have specific biases that are in place. And I believe that what you're doing there is trying to teach people how to get along in a work environment. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So we, um, we all have biases. We may use t- uh, terms like preferences or predispositions or whatever that, that may mean. Um, but biases are just the way that our brain works when it uh, has experience with certain people, foods, places, weather, whatever it may be. And maybe the first few times our brains have experiences with those things, your active brain processes that information. So it's kind of at the front of your brain. But after you've processed something so many times, uh, your active brain no longer uses its energy and it's more limited capacity. And those things start being processed just by your inactive or unconscious brain. So often they, one of the examples I use is that uh, most of us don't remember when it is that we touched fire to remember that it was hot, but that experience happened. And so in the back of our brains, when we see fire, we know it's hot and we're not going to touch it. Most of us, um, it, that's not something we have to think every time fire is hot. I'm not going to touch it. That's just kind of the way that our, our brains will, will develop. Um, and so we'll have these, it's, it, it, it's part of a survival mechanism that our brains and our, and the way that we've developed. Um, so we have these biases and we often make decisions unconsciously based on those biases. Do you have any other examples of that, that how, how that would affect things in the workplace? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, lots of studies have been done and I'm, I'm a, somewhat of a nerd about biases, but one of the studies that's the most popular that's out there is you had, uh, 1,250 resumes sent to about 500 companies, and the resumes were nearly identical, except half the resumes came from Brendan, Greg, Emily, and, and, and Anne, and the other half came from Tamika, Aisha, Rashid, and Tyrone. And so Brendan, Greg, Emily, and Anne, with the exact same resume, uh, had 50% more interviews than Tamika, Aisha, Rashid, and Tyrone. Um, there may be people that are explicitly saying, oh, I'm not interviewing them, but for the most part, what happens is our brains see those names and we don't immediately associate African-American names in the business place or African-American people in the business world. Um, For example, if you are, when I go out to eat in a nicer restaurant in Arizona or if I'm visiting Utah, it is often that me and my wife are the only black people in that that nicer restaurant. Mm -hmm. Um, And so people won't necessarily associate black people with the nicer restaurants, not saying they can't go. We're not prohibited from going. There's nothing like that. But most people just might not associate that. Whereas if I'm in um, New York, if I'm in Atlanta, it's common for there to be a more um, representative percentage of black people in those restaurants. So often, another example I use is that if someone was picking a basketball team between uh, just picking people on their basketball team and they saw you and they saw me and they didn't know anything about either one of us, chances are they're going to pick me. Why? Well, most likely because such a high percentage of NBA basketball players are African-American or minority otherwise, or we think um, black people are athletic, or we think on the other hand, white men can't jump, right? We've heard that. And so often this is just uh, no intentional bias, no hatred, no, um, you know, a lot of times we define racism as, as having this vitriolic hatred towards somebody. It's, it's not that it's just that this has been our experience with these um, again, names, people, weather, whatever it may be, color, police officers pull over red cars more often, right? This is just kind of 
how our brains process it. And so we're more likely to follow those unconscious thoughts and making decisions. Okay. My plan would be just to back you down in the post. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Throw a few bows. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, and I saw you mentioned this before and, and you, and you, you bring up, okay, racism and, and bias. What's, what's the difference between those two? Because a lot of people, a lot of white people would hear, the term racism, and they they see that as as uh, uh, you know a, a, a an epithet almost right to to, to them. It's it's something Absolutely. that is extremely negative. It's extremely triggering. Bias is something different. Is that right? It is. It is different. Often these words, when they're used interchangeably, I think is detrimental to a positive conversation because they're challenging. Even. Racism, I think, is used incorrectly a lot of times, and it's detrimental to a, to a conversation because when you say someone is racist, um, immediately we know in our culture at this time in the United States of America to be called to be, to be a racist is not acceptable. And so once someone says you are racist, then your amygdala becomes active and you either defend, deflect, or attack. And so it doesn't matter if someone, if they were racist, and I'll get into the definitions, even just using that word uh, often stifles a conversation. So textbook definition, if you look at Merriam-Webster, bias is, um, it's an inclination or a temperament. Based on my prior experiences, I will make an unreasoned judgment many times. And sometimes that involves race. Based on my prior experiences with um, playing basketball with all people, all various people of different ethnicities or races, then this people has been better or this people has been worse or whatever. So based on that, my bias is going to make me pick a black person for my team, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Racism is a belief that race is an inherent determin determinator or it, it de inherently determines your worth or value in a specific um, area. So it may be that because you are black, you can play basketball. Because you are white, you cannot play basketball. That's a belief that just your race makes you superior or inferior or more predisposed to something. So one, um, one of the hotter topics uh, that we can talk about when it comes to race is uh, black people or African-American people are incarcerated on drug offenses about five times as much as white people. And so um, if you look at, and I think we may touch on this a little bit later, Ibram X. Kendi, who's a professor who wrote um, How to Be an Anti-Racist and some other books, he would say that people are not racist or anti-racist, like permanently as a noun, but you can do things that are racist or that are anti-racist. And so if someone says Black people are arrested five times as often for drug crimes, a racist thought, I'm not saying someone who has this thought is a racist, I don't want to turn people out, but a racist thought would be either one, that's because black people commit drug crimes five times as often. And so that's why they're doing it. Or another racist thought on the other side is because, well, because it's white police officers who hate black people. And that's why they're doing it. Those are both racism in that they use uh, race as that is the determinant of why someone's arresting or being arrested. Where an anti-racist thought would be, well, if the studies show that people, white people and black people use drugs at about the same rates, which most studies will show. Again, you can get a study to show whatever you want, but I think most independent studies show that they're, they're similar enough. Then you would say, what is wrong with the system that makes black people become more arrested five times more often than white people? So instead of um, saying it's the race of a police officer or a, or a system, I mean, excuse me, of a police officer, a specific individual is racist or um, because you think that black people are criminals or whatever may be as racist, you may say, what is it in the system that makes this disparity happen? Okay. So we'll get into the system stuff a little bit later here, but, but so you, in your, what you're saying is, is that racism can come from both sides then? Um, it depends on how you define racism. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if you define racism as people believing that race, uh, so individual racism, individual racism, any individual can believe that race is, uh, as a, the primary determinant of characteristics. And that's a big deal. Um, if you looked at the Brown versus Board of Education case that made all that, re that required school districts to desegregate, one of the key pieces of evidence was a study done by Kenneth and M M Mimi Clark. 
which showed uh, little four to seven year old black children. And they were, they were shown dolls, a white doll and a black doll. And they said, which one is good? Which one is bad? Which one is smart? Which one is dumb? Which one is pretty? Which one is ugly? And they associated all of the positive characteristics with the white doll and the negative characteristics with the black doll. Textbook, that is racism on an individual level because you think based just on race, there is um, uh, 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 an inherent superiority or inferiority. Um, if you look at systemic racism, then my answer would be different as far as whether anybody can be um, systemically racist. So that's a different story. Here's my question on systemic racism. So a lot of people will say there is no systemic racism in America today, right? And, and, and I think the argument typically on that is, give me an example of, of where the system is racist, and, and I think that, and this gets a little bit more into the critical theory side of things, but a lot of what I see anyway on, on that end of systemic, systemic racism is a call to change the system in, in a way that is not based so much on what might be typical American values, right? Which would be a lot of meritocracy, um, which would be um, something that is... Uh, I've got something here, right? In fact, from Ibram Kendi here is what he says. He says, how many of us say we are not racist? And this goes along with the idea of his, his definition of, you know, of being anti-racist. After expressing there is something wrong with one of the racial groups, after judging different racial groups from our own sociocultural standards, after refusing to believe equal opportunity will produce equal outcomes, among racial groups after supporting race neutral policies that yield racial in inequity. So it seems to me what he's saying here is that the system, even if it's built on equality, is not going to put equal results out there and therefore we need to change a system of equal opportunity. Is that, is that the way you see it? Um, close to what I see it. I, I wouldn't disagree. Um, like, so, so the way that I see it is if the system is not only built, but operated um, with equality, then, and it, and it, and then you have uh, discrepancies or, or disparities. Um, that's one story. If the system was based on um, inequality, and has since been changed to be based on equality, it may take a long time to eliminate the vestiges of the unequal or inequitable systems previously. So that's a, um, so an example, right? Or if we talk about the criminal justice system, if you look at, uh, so what is systemic racism? So systemic racism is, is, a, is a system that, um, We'll usually discriminate based on race. So slavery is systemic racism, right? Slavery in the United sure. States, race-based slavery is systemic racism. Um, black codes that happened uh, in the southern United States especially, that's systemic racism where certain laws were targeted based on race. Uh, Jim Crow laws, systemic racism. Um, segregation, again, systemic racism. In the system, we, it's based on race, how we treat other people. That's systemic racism. And so these uh, systems and laws were ingrained in our country for so long, even before independence, but especially after independence, were ingrained in our country for so long that if you just immediately say, okay, cut all that stuff out. We're not doing that stuff anymore. Now let's treat everybody equally. Um, it won't necessarily have an equal effect on everyone. So what's an example of that? Um, let's look at credit scores, for example. Um, if you look at the system of redlining, which was a system by which both uh, government and non-governmental um, actors drew, literally got maps and drew red lines around specific neighborhoods where we said, this is going to be a black neighborhood, this is going to be a white neighborhood. You combine that with uh, GI Bill home loans where white returned uh, uh, people in the military were able to get loans and black people were not to purchase a home. And then what you get is you get uh, a system in which black people are, are less likely to be homeowners, right? And so this happened a long time ago, but it's going to take so long for black people to catch up in home ownership 
Well, that system also affects your credit score. Now, how is that? You could have a person, um, you could have two people with the exact same job, income, credit history, um, bills, and their credit scores will be different if one of them owns a home and another one rents a home. And so this is one way that a system, even a prior system, can continue to affect something going on now. And so those two people with different credit scores, now when they go to get a loan for whatever it may be, the system is going to treat one of them more favorably and give them better terms than the other. I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a residual effect from, from a systemic racial policy uh, that was there. What, what would you say is, um, what would you say, where are we at today in the United States with systemic racism? What would your opinion on that be? It depends on the, on the, um, I guess the area. So, you know, when it comes to criminal law, which is a big one, the criminal justice system, uh, I see a lot of vestiges of prior systems, um, that have a disproportionately negative effect on African-American people or black people in America. So um, going back to, you know, race-based slavery, Jim Crow laws, all the things that I just named, segregation, um, we had this image in our minds in the United States of black people as dangerous. Like close your eyes, picture, picture a thug, picture a super predator and he's black, you know, nine times out of 10. And it's a male, nine times out of 10. That's what's been ingrained in our minds and in, 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 uh, or a gangbanger or whatever it is. That's what's ingrained in our minds. And so that's what we see. Um, and police officers are human like the rest of us. Um, they are human beings that have the same biases that I have or that anyone else has. And so if their mind, in their mind, black people are dangerous, then they're going to be more on edge when they're in a black community. Or if poor people are dangerous, they're going to be more on edge in a poor community. And that can lead to uh, um, if I'm a police officer and I'm scared, and this isn't, I'm not saying white police officers. I'm not saying it's, it's a white guy that, mm-hmm. that there's a problem with. I, I often share a study in my bias trainings about um, uh, uh, this fictitious legal memo that was put out, created several, sent to several hundred partners in law firms. And again, the only difference was between, with a name that was traditionally considered Anglo and a name contri- traditionally considered African-American. And with the African-American one, um, and there were intentional errors in this memo. And with the, the ones with the African-American name, all of the partners found far more errors in the African-American than in the Anglo, even though they were identical. And it's not all the, the white male partners who identify as straight or heterosexual, all of them, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, didn't matter. Everyone saw that. These are something, and that's from that doll test from Bo- Brown versus Board of Education. Mm-hmm. These were little black kids that saw that. And so all of our minds have just understood this. And if you grew up in conservative Arizona or Utah or Idaho, I played football in Idaho at Idaho State University. I remember I had a teammate, nicest guy in the world. I don't think he was uh, racist, anything. I got a good friend of mine and he said, I've never talked with a black person before. And, and that's fine. It, where he was from, small town Idaho. So if the only black people that he had seen are athletes, um, those on the news, and, and, and I think you can see that conservative news portrays um, at least when it comes to criminal law, black people different than uh, liberal news um, represents black people. How do you you see that? I see, um, for example, if you are looking at uh, modern day, uh, if you're watching conservative news, they are talking about rioting and looting. And if you're watching liberal news, they're talking about protesting, right? (laughs) So these are, these are things that guess what? There is, there is, protesting going on and there is rioting and looting going on um, from my perspective from and, and I try to view so many different news sources because frankly I just don't trust so many of them the ones that try to tell you what to think including some of the most popular ones so I try to review several of them and, and think for myself rather than have thinking done for me um, but if you look uh, and I have looked at those and I would judge that upper 90%, nine, maybe 98, 99, probably more than that percent of those out protesting have done zero violence, zero rioting, zero looting. But um, similar to the civil rights movements back in the 60s, if you, can, um, if you can make people think that, well, the only thing going on is these people are trying to push communism or they're trying to overthrow the government and you focus on rioting and looting, then what you're doing is you're drowning out the message that we're talking about, uh, there should be racial equality. So I, I, 
I think that there's been a way a high level of overrepresentation of people talking about rioting and looting um, when that's such a minor part of what's going on. But it makes sense. And all the studies have shown that if you if you talk about protesters, then people will have a more favorable view than if you talk about rioters and looters. So I, I again, this is one area where I think depending, a, a lot of political people and political parties have made things political that, that, that shouldn't be political. Okay. Let me finish up on, on more on the business side here a little bit. It, you know, looking at diversity and inclusion. Um, how do you see, uh, you know, because I'm guessing that you're, you know, you're, you're, you're looking at the publications <laughs> that many people that would be teaching what you teach in larger corporations and reading the same types of things. How, how is identity politics right now, for example, playing out in, in business? How would you define identity politics? I would define not positively. <laughs> I would, I would define identity politics as, um, an increasing, uh, understanding of who we are based on our, the color of our skin, our, our sexual orientation, and our position in a, uh, what is a perceived power, power hierarchy in the United States. Perfect. That's, that is very helpful for me. Um, I think that there are so many misunderstandings out there about how to discuss uh, our identities. And even when we identify or label ourselves as one specific thing to the ex exclusion of everything else, that can be problematic. Um, so on the one hand, we have this, I am black, I am gay, I am whatever, however someone would identify themselves, I am white, I am heterosexual. And if that is the most important thing about you, then that will often drown out uh, things that are actually very important to who you are as an employee, who you are as a person, et cetera. And so uh, we can have such, I guess if you define it as identi identity politics, or you can, it can be so important to you that you are um, black or white or straight or gay or however you want to define it, that it kind of, it, it may interfere with the importance of all other things. And on the other end of the spectrum, you can say, well, why can't we all just be colorblind? right? We shouldn't we be colorblind and not see color? Um, when we are colorblind and we don't see color, often we don't see the value that comes from diversity and experience. And it may be literally color we don't see, or it may that we say we don't see, um, or it may be some other experience. Uh, and, and that can devalue uh, the value that someone has had in a different experience. And it can also be seen as um, when you're in a culture that is predominantly one color and you say to others, um, I don't see color, it can also be seen as saying everyone needs to be in this category with this one color. It, no, you might not, no one may intend it to be that way. And it may, when it's said, it might not actually mean that, but it can be perceived that way and that can be problematic to bringing people together. So how do I see that in the business world? Um, a lot of companies are um, putting together like diversity and inclusion committees, affinity groups, and other groups that will recognize the power of diversity. And, and anybody who has questions about how important diversity is, um, you can Google, you know, the business case for diversity, et cetera. You'll see that our minds, um, uh, let's talk about a council, and we may talk about church things later, but how our church works in councils. Let's talk about a council and that when we have a council of people working together, one of the benefits is that we have a diversity of thought and opinions. So we can look at, a, at an issue from, a, from a, a, a more complete perspective. Another benefit of having diversity in a council, which could be in your business, is that when you are around people who think differently than you, your brain functions differently and fires differently. So if I'm around a group of a lot of people who think the same way that I do, or at least I think they think the same way that I do, then I'm more likely to fall into groupthink and not share a difference of opinion, but instead kind of say what the group says. But if I'm in a group with others who have different opinions or I perceive they have different opinions, I'm going to be, my brain's going to fire um, a little bit more so that I'm going to think a little bit more thoroughly how I can persuade them or inform them of something that they didn't do. So in our business world right now, a lot of companies are seeing the benefits of diversity and that the more thoroughly we can look at uh, at an issue, the better we're going to be able to resolve that, the better we're going to be able to break into new areas, new clients, new customers, et cetera. 
Um, sometimes in so doing, and I'll give you an example, I do work with a lot of companies on uh, their diversity and inclusion principles. I'll have a company ask me, should we have a, 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 a white male who identifies as straight on our diversity and inclusion committee? And I say, <laughs> uh, of, absolutely, of course you should have a white male on your diversity and inclusion committee. How in the world can you leave that perspective out? Like if diversity really means a diversity of experience, then that means everyone's different experience. It doesn't mean that just because white males are in the majority in the business world or in your office or in whatever, um, whatever area that you are in, that they're already spoken for and we don't listen to them. That would be a huge mistake to not include um, white males in your diversity and inclusion committee and practices and policies, et cetera. So those kind of, to me, seems in the business world right now, you've got a lot of people that, um, are gung-ho on diversity um, and, and that might overlook what we consider, you know, the, uh, the white male perspective. And you've got others who often say, there's no issue. I'm going to be colorblind and we're just going to um, treat everybody fairly. Uh, let me go a little bit more into uh, the defund, defund police on, on Black Lives Matter and, and that idea. Um, you, you teach a, a course or have taught a course on race and the law is is that did you guys cover a lot of prison reform and, and things like that in there we touch on prison reform a little bit it's it's mostly a historical um a historical look at the laws of the united states and how they helped um create or perpetuate the idea of race and then how race has affected how some of these laws have developed and so okay. One way that I explain it is prior to race-based slavery in the United States, there wasn't really black. There was Nigerian, Ethiopian, et cetera. There was African, um, but there wasn't really black. And there wasn't really white. There was, you know, European, uh, whatever it may be. But when mm -hmm. you got to laws that, that looked at um, your status and your ability to be a citizen based on, um, on nationality, it was easier to say black and white than to say many of the other things. Now, that's a simple breakdown, but that's essentially what the beginning of it and then how that affected the creation of all laws throughout the history of the United States. Okay, so with where we are now, um, let me bring up another, another, another quote from Ibram Kendi here. He says, in, in 1858, Abraham Lincoln warned that America could not remain half slave and half free. Today, the country remains divided by racism, and the threat is as existential as it was before the Civil War. Would you agree with that? Uh, it, it depends on what area. The country as a whole, no, I, I, I don't think we can compare the country as a whole now to, to right before the Civil War. Uh, if you talk about whether we are segregated right now, I do agree that we're segregated. I mean, look in your neighborhood, and I'm not going to ask you to answer this, but how diverse is your neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. The neighborhoods in the United States are not diverse at all. And much of that is based on, uh, you know, historical redlining and prior systems that, that, that were, you know, home loans and just really creating these neighborhoods that were black neighborhoods, Hispanic, white, et cetera. But much of it is just, uh, frankly, that as, a, as human beings, we like to be comfortable and we like to be around people that we feel are similar to us. And so often we will move into a neighborhood with people that we feel are similar to us. And, and one of the easiest identifiable characteristics is skin color or race. And so do I think we are as segregated as we were pre-Civil War? In many ways, we're much more segregated. Uh, I think what a lot of people don't understand is that prior to um, the Civil War, uh, there was this readily recognizable and known difference between races, right? You knew that you were black and you were white and you had your specific role because the laws told you that you were a citizen, you weren't, you were free, you weren't. And so you had your specific role and often these people would interact, including a lot of um, sexual relationships, et cetera, that um, they mixed a lot more. There was actually less segregation in a lot of ways, but once, um, once the Civil War happened and then slavery was emancipated and, and, and slowly completely eradicated, um, well, at least race-based slavery as we know it in the United States, um, then you had all of these laws that are better known as Jim Crow laws and segregation laws that really had to create um, new separations like miscegeny laws, right? You could not, a white person could not marry a black person. You created the segregation. Um, you, you had property deeds and a lot of people, their deeds, if, you're, if your home is old enough, it's gonna say you can't sell your house to a black person. Like a lot of these were created to create this new separation that didn't necessarily exist pre 
civil war. So that's a that's an extremely long answer, right? To say, in some ways, um, his quote about us being as segregated as pre civil. Well, he doesn't war, say segregated accurate. though. He says divided by racism. I think that's okay. different. So divided. I think we are divided by race often. Divided by racism. I guess I would have to understand. Um, what he means. If he means like, for example, I know there are studies out there. If you ask, um, if you ask a white person in the United States, uh, whether race is an issue in policing, you know, I think a minority of respondents answer yes, like somewhere in the 30 or 40%. And if you have to ask a black person that, then it's like 80% or above. So if by divided by racism, he means that race, people that identify with a specific race are divided on whether racism is an issue, then I agree with that. Okay. Do I agree that we have as much racism as there was pre-Civil War? I, I From everything that I've read and studied pre-Civil War, I'd say no. I, 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 I wouldn't agree with that. And see, that's, that's something where we are, you know, I, I think that you know, I don't know if it's a black white issue or whatnot, but to me, that's astounding to think that you would think that, right? Because, and, and maybe it's an ignorance issue. I, I don't know, but, but I think most people, most white people, there, it would, it, there would be zero hesitation as far as saying, are we still divided as much by racism as we were at the time before the civil war? So it, it seems to me like there's a, there's a pretty big gap there. Yeah, there's a huge gap. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, I, and I think it's often because um, most white people in the United States don't have to see race on a daily basis, right? You can go to your workplace where your race is, is represented as the majority. You can look at politicians where your race is represented as a majority, at police where your race is represented as a majority. You can go to a store and you can find foods that you are used to eating. You can, you can live your life without looking at race, as we call it where other people, um, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, East Asian, how, however you want to look at it, often um, you'll go into your workplace. Like I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a partner in a big law firm and I've been a partner in three, uh, two big law firms and one medium-sized law firm. And in each one, I've been the only black partner, right? I think black people in Arizona are about 6%, but black lawyers in Arizona are about 1.2% and black partners across the nation, there just aren't very many. Mm -hmm. And so... When I walk in, I do um, think about race, and I do see things in a world that is different than than maybe I'm used to. If I'm going is that, to a, is that racism, or is that feeling like I'm I'm not like most other people that are here? I mean, isn't that a, isn't that a difference? I think there's a, yeah, there's a difference between racism and a difference between um, bias, or a difference between being like others that are there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so absolutely. So, so, I, so, and maybe I, uh, maybe I said it wrong, or maybe we just didn't communicate well. When it comes to uh, Ibram X. Kendi saying that we're as divided on racism as we were, you know, pre-Civil War. Um, again, I, I, I guess I'd have to read more of the context, but I would not agree with that. Um, as far as, especially if you look at our tensions as high as they were. No, I don't think they are. Um, are clearly obvious racial laws and systems and, and positions as outspoken as they were? Absolutely not. Um, do, are we as segregated as we were? Yes. And if we see that segregation is not based on racism, then you cannot agree with what he says, right? You'd have to say that that segregation is based on racism. So I, you know, to the extent his quote is used to say, racism is as bad in 2020 as it was in 1850, then I would disagree with that. Um, but I, yeah, I would say I would disagree with that. So, so bringing it into context here, before I get back to the defund police here, um, you know, one thing that he really pushes is anti-racism, right? Which is basically taking more of an active role, right? And so I think that a lot of, a lot of people in the United States feel like, well, wait a minute, how can there be racism? Because I don't see it, right? You know, and that, that would be my personal experience. I, I, I don't feel that. I don't know anybody that feels that. I, I that doesn't come up in a conversation with anybody. You know, it, it's it's like, well, wait a minute, why? What are you talking about oppression? What are you talking about uh, racism here? Because I don't, you know, and that's a truth. And my my lived experience is, I just 
the only time I ever see it is on the news. Right. <laughs> right. I, I don't see that in my personal life at all. I don't see it at work. I, I don't see it, you know, as far as, and I'm not talking about something where, as you're saying, like the credit scores, right? Because that's something I would not see. I wouldn't understand that. I would not see that. That's definitely true. But as far as a, well, okay, where someone is trying to say that they are superior than someone else because of their race, I have to go on the internet or turn on the news to, to ever get a reference to that. And I think that that's, that's one of the, you know, that, that's, that's one of the big gaps there that, that is, my experience obviously is not the same as yours, but when, when we talk about racism, I'm usually thinking people that are saying, you know, black people aren't as good as white people, or I'm specifically going to harm someone in economically or in any other way because of their skin color. Right. And much of that just lies in the definition. And, and that's why I, I really focus on bias um, as opposed to racism, because you can see bias based on race that's different from racism. So what does that mean? That, 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 or, or an experience with that. Uh, I don't know how often you get followed around in stores. Mm-hmm. I get followed around in stores by, sure. by, by clerks and by other workers. And I think this is unbelievable, but it happens to me. Um, is that racism? Because that clerk intentionally says, oh, there's a black person. I'm going to discriminate against him. No. Um, could it be seen as racism because we think, okay, black people are more likely to be criminal because they're arrested more often? That could be defined as racism. I like to define it as bias just to say, based on this person's experiences, whether real or perceived, whether in person or on TV, media, news, whatever it may be, is that black people are more likely to steal something. And so he's following me around in a store. So you might not have that experience and it might not happen very often in your life, but it happens to me. Um, and I usually just brush it off and say, this person is ignorant. They don't know any better, but I've got privilege. Like I, I'm a, an attorney in a big law firm. I can afford to go to a different store and, and go buy something else. I've also got education that I'm, that I'm an attorney and I speak at a lot of places that I could go up to this person or the manager and say, excuse me, can I help you? Like, is there a reason why you're following me around the store without feeling like, whatever, like I'm going to get shot or whatever. I feel empowered by my education experience and um, et cetera. So um, it's not as, it doesn't affect me as much. And I think I see that sometimes when you hear like people that want to quote uh, Morgan Freeman or other black people that, that, that come out and say, oh, you know, there's no issues with black people getting harassed. I don't have any of those issues. And I think, man, that's fantastic for you. Uh, I've Mr. seen Freeman, those, those references. Because, yeah. Denzel <laughs> because, Washington and others. Yeah. yeah. Like that's fantastic for them because if, uh, um, if a police officer pulls him over, they're going to say, oh, pff, that's Morgan Freeman. That's Denzel Washington. They're not going to discriminate against them. Mm-hmm. They're not going to see them in a certain way as dangerous or whatever. They're going to probably ask them for their autograph and let them go. Same thing if they're followed around in the store. If they pull up to the store and they're driving a $100,000 car and they're wearing these super fancy clothes. Like for me, example, for example, I, um, when I'm dressed up in a suit and tie, there's a huge difference between how people treat me than when I'm in my basketball shorts and my T-shirt. There's a huge difference and it's almost laughable, but I understand that when someone sees uh, a black person in a suit and tie, that is really not as threatening to them. Whereas they see a black person in athletic clothes, it feels a little bit more threatening. So that's, it is a different experience. And I think that most white people in America, thankfully, don't feel, don't see race, um, don't have to deal with race on a regular basis. But just, just picture for yourself for a minute, if you... Um, had to go to work in a predominantly black neighborhood, low socioeconomic inner city neighborhood. As you drove into that neighborhood, as you parked your car, as you walked by all of the black people, as you went into your job, as you walked into your office and most of the people were black um, and the way that they spoke was more uh, associated with the way that black people speak, you would see it a little bit differently. You, I mean, sure. just think right now when you're in the black neighborhoods and, sure. and that's how... And, and that doesn't mean that you're racist or the black people are racist, but you would have a different experience. And so black people living in a place where they are the minority and anyone, Asian, Hispanic, again, where they are the minority, they see race a little bit more. Okay. No, that's a great point. That's a great point. Uh, I want to get real quickly to this, to defund police and, 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 and the prison reform just a little bit. Big call for defunding the police. Um, the organization Black Lives Matter has pushed this. You know, it's so interesting to me that so many things are changing. And this is, I, I, you know, back in the 60s with the civil rights movement, 
which is very, to me, very different from what we're seeing today. Right. I, I, I think that, you know, I see, I see Dr. King in, in, in one side of here with something that, are, that I would view a little bit more as American values and, and in a way that is, uh, you know, let's not see each other, you know, a little more of the colorblind thing that you bring up. Right. And, and then, and then I see the leaders today, the black leaders today, at least the ones that are pushing a lot of, you know, even Ibram Kendi and, and, uh, um, those that would subscribe a little bit more to white fragility and, and the critical critical theory out there, in in a very different light from from what happened back then in the civil rights movement and and and, and with Dr. King. But you know, back then there was a big issue about freedom of speech because you had a a the status quo, and so if you're outside of the status quo, freedom of speech is going to be really important to you. Right. But today, what I think is a cultural war that has been won more by, let's say, the left. It's it's the opposite now. Right. It's like, OK, well, this isn't a tool that we're going to use quite as much as freedom of speech. In fact, we can look more toward hate speech and, and, and kind of even shut some things down. And I, I think that I see the same thing with with the defund police thing. Right. It, it's like, OK, back in the 90s with the Clinton crime bill. I think it was 100,000 cops they put out that the, the federal government helped, helped support in putting out there um, to, to decrease crime. Uh, violent crime had skyrocketed and had been skyrocketing for, for quite a while. So this crime bill was seen by most people and by mo- most black leaders, not all, you know, as something very positive. And, and okay, we're going to have more police out on the streets and we're going to reduce crime, right? We've now gone here where I think the pendulum has swung all the way to the other side. And, and now the, the policemen in many ways and by many people are seen as the enemy, not because they're helping to decrease crime, but because of the interactions that are happening, happening, especially in black neighborhoods you know, the issues that are coming up there. And of course now video shows us everything and all, all of the, the bad actors out there. We see all of that now. I've had uh, um, policemen on this show before, and I've talked to them about that. And it's interesting because they're trained in a specific way that at least on paper and listening to it makes a lot of sense, right? They believe that what their job is to do is to go out in any of the communities that they're patrolling, that they're responsible for, and get to know everybody, right? It, it's, it's like one, one police officer I, I interviewed said, you know, it's, it's, you've got to go out and find out who is the most important people in that community, and you've got to go make friends with them. It might be the grandma on the corner of the street. and It might be, you know, a, a retired man, you know, a block over. You know, wherever it is, you go out and you, you, you interact, and you make these interactions and you become friends and you, you become friends with the kids. You know, that's what Jocko Willick, I don't know if you know Jocko Willick is the same type of thing. When they were out in Iraq, they were told you can't just drive by. You can't just drive by in your Humvee and, and show this military presence. You've got to go out and get out of the Humvee. You've got to go and shake hands and talk to people and get to know them. And, you know, that was very important for them. But but at the same time, the problem is, the flip side of that, is that the more interactions that you have, the, you're going to have another side of the coin, right? You're going to have more issues where they don't have to come up, right? You're going to, if, if you've got more interaction and you've got more cops out on the beat, then there's going to be more you know, pat downs, you're going to find more drugs, you're going to find more problems. And you're going to be putting more people away into jail and prison. And and so what, what is the right balance with that? What is the answer to that? Because I've always had a tough time, you know, considering this and thinking, what is the solution? Because wherever yeah, you go, where you remove the policeman, the crime goes up, it does go up, and especially violent crime goes up. Uh, yeah, thank you for, uh, I think that's a, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, but at the same time, the, the, 
One of the biggest, to me, the most heartbreaking things about problems of the inner city, for example, is taking young men and putting them into what might be a worse circumstance because they had some drugs on them or whatever it is. They were carrying a gun even or whatever. And, and, and putting them into worse circumstance, going, sending them off to prison and maybe destroying their lives. And taking yeah, them away, you know, you've got someone who's married and you've got kids and they're, they're taken away and put into prison. What are you doing to that community? You're reducing crime. You know, you're reducing, you do, it's, it's the broken windows theory, right? I mean, you're, 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 you're reducing violent crime, but, but you're also hurting a community. Yeah. So there's uh, there's so many things in that. I appreciate um that background. I wanted to touch a few of them so we can get to get to kind of the more recent where you got to. One, I wanted to touch on Martin Luther King Jr. I think that now we look back at him and romanticize that everyone loved him. And I think we forget that he was hated by many, if not most people. His wife was taken. He was investigated by the FBI for a long time. So many things were planted on him to try to take him down. And he, now we romanticize and we look at his quotes about have a dream that everyone is treated equally. And we don't look at his quotes about what happens when you treat people in, in equally and inequitably and how you need to speak up when you're discriminated against and how rioting is the voice of the unheard. So I think that when we look back at Martin Luther King Jr. and we say, we love him, man, I wish he was around now today. We don't recognize that we will attack the people today that are doing the same things he did before. One example of that, and I'm not, everybody's going to get offended or whatever, but take it for whatever you are. I'm not equating Colin Kaepernick with Martin Luther King Jr. So I'm not, so just, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. But kneeling down, first consulting with a a former, um, uh, with a military veteran about what would be a a respectful way to, um, to protest this brutality, um, you know, is it kneeling? Is it, is it, you know, whatever it is not coming out for the national anthem here, he is peacefully protesting and you have people that have lost their minds about how evil Colin Ka- Kaepernick is and about how he hates America and anybody who would kneel down hates America. They hate police. They hate the military. They're not grateful. Um, and he's doing very similar peaceful protest to say, Hey, there's a problem. But what happens is people um, who don't want to deal with that problem want to attack him for his peaceful protests and say, don't protest that way. That's kind of a long story to say, there are people that are peacefully protesting. Often, you know, protesting does what? What you want to do is you, protesters interfere with your way of life so that they get their message heard. And so if it's not interfering with your way of life, then often they don't, some protesters think it's not protesting. You could have, you could have hunger strikes, et cetera, that don't interfere with you. They just it can kill the person doing it, et cetera. So that's just one I wanted to touch on is that Martin Luther King Jr. was called by many leaders, um, uh, political leaders, government leaders, church leaders. He was called a communist and, and, and the whole civil rights movement of the 1960s was an attempt to overthrow the United States government and, and the American way of life. So it, those things were said, not by fringe people. Those were said by, you know, leaders of countries and churches and, and et cetera, including our country. So um, I, just to look at that idea of romanticizing Martin Luther King Jr. and putting down current black leaders because of that. I, I think that that's just a, a false narrative. Do we have Martin Luther King Jr.'s out there today? Um, not anyone as well known as he was. Do we have anyone who had his, uh, the equality of his character? And I don't know. I mean, from what I've seen, he was a great man. Like so many other people are great men, but flawed like anyone else. Um, I, I don't think it's fair to try to compare people today to our romanticized version of Martin Luther King Jr. I want to touch a little bit on the increase in policing during the Clinton administration. Um, And uh, I think this paints a great picture to that. This is not necessarily a Republican or a Democrat issue or principle. I think often uh, Republicans will look at this and say, well, see it, Democrats did it. So there's nothing wrong with us doing it. Bill Clinton did it. So there's nothing wrong with uh, with George Bush doing it or whatever. Barack Obama did it. So what's wrong with with, uh, President Trump doing it? Democrats don't speak for all black people. Black people don't speak for all black people. <laughs> like their po- political people are politically motivated. Um, and so uh, when Bill Clinton has this increase in, uh, in police force, 
Uh, Bill Clinton was a great politician uh, and like, like Donald Trump was a great politician, regardless of what we think about them as individuals, they know how to get um, uh, certain people persuaded and motivated. And that is often what politicians do, regardless of whether we agree with them on a personal level. So I'm a person who does not believe that an increase in policing leads to a decrease in crime or violent crime. I think that an increase in policing um, from all the studies that I've seen has negligible, if any, effect on crime. Um, I think that the, the example that you shared, which I, which I don't know if it's most often referred to as community policing, but police getting involved and, and knowing people in the communities in which they work is vital and crucial to building relationships. Uh, if you build those relationships, those are the type of things I think that are going to reduce and eliminate crime. Uh, whether it's more police or, or fewer police, building those relationships. One thing I think about um, the defund police um, is one, I think it's, it's uh, you can call it terrible, you can call it unfortunate, you can call it whatever you want, but the word usage of defund police to me is uh, frankly for the first probably 10 times I heard that term, I thought, I'm not even going to listen to that. Like, <laughs> how ridiculous do you have to be to say we're going to completely eliminate police from the streets? How, how are we going to operate as community states, countries, et cetera, with zero police? And so for the, for the first several times I heard it, I said, that's awful. Um, I think uh, if you look at the mainstream, if you look at the, you know, the far lefts or the far rights of anything, you, you, they are extreme and they're, they're, I think, completely unreasonable. Mm -hmm. If you look at what I see as a mainstream position about defund police, I think it would be better called um, reallocate funding uh, to allow police to do their important police functions and allow others such as social workers, um, those who have more experience with addictions and mental health, et cetera, all the things that we require our police to do now, domestic relations stuff, we should let provide that funding to other people who are better equipped and trained to address those issues and then allow police the funding that they need to, to do their police work. That may mean more funding, that may mean less funding, but I think that the defund police wording is, um, it's just a complete turnoff to so many people because if you're literally interpreting that to mean take away money from our police force, then that's a non-starter for most people. Not just, not just Republicans, white, but for most people, it's a non-starter for me to completely el eliminate police from, from our communities. It's just a non-starter. So I think that that's one where uh, many people say defund the police are, 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 you know, their worst enemy because that it's such the statement, the definition, the term is so, um, I guess, unreasonable to so many people that it's, it just doesn't make any sense. And it does often portray police as the bad guys. Now, let me, let me give you a brief experience of me growing up. I grew up in Pasadena, California, Altadena. Um, my mom lived in Covina. We were around, you know, LAPD and other um, Southern California. This is in the 80s and 90s where I'm a young teenager. I was literally harassed by police officers based on race, called racial terms, um, told that they were there to protect their people, not mine, often asked what gang I was in, uh, it just uh, all kinds of times from police. It was completely ridiculous. Like these were, these police officers were completely ridiculous. It was, it was unbelievable that what they did, but it was what it was, whether it was these specific individuals, whatever, whatever, that was life. Now my experience is I have several police officer friends, white male police officers who are the best of the best people that I know and who um, put their lives on the lines every single day for so many people who go out of their way, who have shared stories with me about experiences where they have not shot someone and they've been thinking about, well, that this person is black. If I shoot him, what's going to happen to my family? What's going to happen to my career? What's going to, in situations where I told my friends, I, I, I hate to sound callous and I don't have the training that you had, but I think I would have shot him to make sure that I went home to my family that day. Now, do I believe that there's way too much violence against unarmed black people? I do. But do I believe that the police officers that are doing it are always these racist, hateful people? I don't. I think that there's actually a, a, a better conversation that can be had that we realize that um, both the people who are being investigated by police and the police officers are human beings. Some both people make mistakes, people do good things. And so um, I, the, the conversations when they happen on these far extremes and not between people who really want to have a conversation, but people who want to talk at or past people, I think it harms the rest of us. So to, so to the extent that we want to have this rallying cry for, for one or the other, 
I think we might not realize that we're making it more dangerous both for police officers and for the communities that, that they police. When if we could build relationships like you mentioned, then we would make it safer. And I think crime would go down and relationships would get better. I fully support what you're saying there. Now, a couple issues on the funding there. In speaking with police officers, one of one of the problems with the idea of having social workers come in in place of, say, having police where, where that, that is available, you know, the police actually go out with them, right? So, so because you have the possibility, especially with a lot of people that might, let's say you've got people that are, um, um, you know, they're, they're heavily influenced by drugs at times. Um, and I'm not talking about black individuals, right? I'm talking about anybody that is going to have a social work, worker come in. The police actually go with them. And, and, and make sure that those social workers are safe. And I've been told many stories where, you know, if those police weren't around and you had the social workers go there, a lot of them women, you're, you're, you're going to run into a lot of problems because they go out and visit those individuals at their homes, right? So that's one issue. The other one is, is the issue of training, right? Because, you know, for example, um, the George Floyd incident, right, is, uh, is is in part an issue of training, is what I've been told, because the other two cops that were there were were I think they were rookies or really new, and there's very little training that goes on for these for these cops in going into those situations. You know, it's like okay, if someone's there and and they've got a knee down on someone's neck like that you've got to go in and say, Hey, let me take over for a minute. You know, there, there's very little training that goes on. And when the, when any kind of defunding happens, usually because of the economy, that's the number one reason. The very, very first thing to go in police departments is training. Yeah. So I love that. Yeah. So absolutely. I'd love to address both of those. One, the police going out with social workers example. Absolutely. Often that's what's needed. I see it more, more than the social workers. I see it in domestic relations issues. Like, Domestic relations, I think, and I could be wrong, but I think j- domestic relations um, result in a large percentage of the actual shootings, violent, you know, um, attacks, especially against police. They go in in the domestic relations situation and get shot at many times. If you look at when police officers are shot, it's trying to investigate a domestic relations situation. It can also be when you, like you talk about it, the social worker situation. That definitely happens. Do I think that that's 100% of the time or 90 or 80 or 70? I don't. Do I think that it's 5% of the time? Probably not. But whatever percentage it is, if it's 30, 40, 50, 60, um, there could be times in which you don't need a police officer to come in. Um, and, and, and there could be a lot of things in which we don't need police officers to come in that, that they are in there. Um, and there could be other times that you do need them. I, it doesn't have to be an all or not. I don't think it should ever be an all or not. And I think talking about those extremes often interferes with, with reasonable conversations moving forward. I do think that there are things that we use our police force that we don't have to use them for, that we could better use them in other ways, including some of the, the social work, drug issues, domestic relations issues. Can we completely leave them out of those? No, because they go in and save lives and they, and they, and help a lot of people. We need them. Absolutely. Um, do we need our police to be militarized and have assault rifles and tanks and military grade weapons? Usually not. Like we, we probably, from my perspective, perspective. No, I fully agree. Usually with that. not. I fully Is, agree with that. Yeah. Are there some situations where we need police to have those? Um, there are rare situations. You hear of your um, people who get dressed in their bulletproof everything, and they've got all of these things, and they've got the stuff that the police have, and they and they have these. Mm-hmm. And there are going to be times do in those situations, do we then actually bring in the military? Do we have to wait? I don't know. I'm not, there are going to be situations where we need it. Do we need it as much? I, I don't think we do. When it comes to um, the training issue with the George Floyd issue. Um, and, and so one, is that a training issue? I think training could absolutely help with that. I think there's also a, um, I don't know how to say it within police forces. There's also a, 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 a mindset or a, um, you know, the way that, that the police force operates. So, so they are in a challenging situation. Like I almost compare it to a, um, 
uh, an athlete in a football game or whatever it may be, you're going to go into an intense situation right now. So you have to be ready that someone can take your life at any time. Like you have to be prepared for that. Um, and so police need to be trained on how to be prepared for that while still de-escalating. And like, I think of, you know, back playing sports, like you were, you were on edge when you went into that situation. So something that was going to happen, um, or something that ordinarily wouldn't bother you could really bother you and could really cause you to, 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 to jump out and do something. If you're with other police officers, you've been trained, they've been trained. It would have been great for another police officer to come in and say, Hey man, I got this. I got this. Um, here, I got this. You go ahead and take a break. And I got, I'll hold, it's my turn to hold them down and keep everybody safe. I got this. Uh, I think that often in a police board, like you see, I hear often of the thin blue line, right? Like, don't cross that line, no matter what. I think that's a dangerous mentality. Like, if you have a police officer who's, who's gone rogue or who's done something dangerous, then we, then we need to do something about that. We shouldn't say, hey, we protect our brothers no matter what. I, I mean, I see that almost similar to, like, if we want to talk about rioting and looting, you have your protesters out there. If you're out protesting, which I think is a, protesting is a powerful way to get your, your voice heard. If you're out protesting uh, about racial discrimination and you have protesters that are going down to, to snatch somebody out of their car, this is different. If somebody's trying to run over protesters with their car and kill them, that's, that's a different situation. But if you have somebody peacefully walking by or driving through and, and you have other quote unquote protesters out to, to harm them, that's not a good thing. You ought to police that situation to the extent you can. If they've got guns and whatnot, you get yourself out of there. You don't want to get yourself killed, you know, trying to whatever. But the same way that, that protesters should be policing those very, very few that are rioting and, and looting, police officers should be addressing those very few that are, you know, intentionally going out, intentionally going out and doing things based on racial lines. In a tense situation, that's just hard. It's just hard to do. It's easy for us to look back at in, in hindsight and to see the video. But I think that training is key um, and will help in those situations. Will it eliminate those situations? Probably not. We're going to have crime and criminals and people who do things in violent ways. And we're going to need police that will address it. And sometimes they're going to make good decisions and sometimes they're going to make bad decisions. I hope training will help them to make more good decisions than, than, than bad, than more good than, 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 uh, than is currently done. Uh, and I think that uh, if we're if we're reallocating funding, then perhaps we don't uh, reduce training funding, but we reduce funding somewhere else, maybe in from military grade um, weapons, or maybe we actually just increase funding for police for training. But I, I so, so that's kind of probably where I see the the whole defund police. Um, I guess movement, I've actually seen a lot of good things. I don't know if, if you've seen it, but there have been a lot of changes in policies like choke holds, body cameras, et cetera. I think those are good things. Is it annoying for a police officer that you have to be watched all the time, even though 99% of the time or 90% of police officers or whatever are good guys out there doing good things? Is it annoying that you have to wear that body camera? Probably is annoying. Can it actually protect you in the long run when you end up shooting somebody and it shows that that you were absolutely in the right shooting them to protect yourself and protect, protect others. Good. Sure. Yeah. appreciate that. I agree with pretty much everything you said. Um, all right. I want to go to your article that you, that you put your opinion piece in the Deseret news. Here's what it's titled. I'm grateful for what our founding fathers did, but they were far from perfect. Before going into what was written here, what, what, uh, why did you decide that you wanted to put this in there? The title? No, the, the, the article itself. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to mention, first of all, I didn't, I didn't create the title. So often when you, okay. when you do, when you do it, uh, an op-ed, you'll do the piece and they will do the title that is going to catch people's eyes. Right. Okay. So sure. That is not my title. Um, I, I don't, I don't strongly disagree. I actually agree with that, but I can mm -hmm. tell the, 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 the title was made to catch some eyes. So, why did I um, draft that piece? Uh, I think often what happens is we will be talking about um, either a founding father or a church leader or some person that we um, revere, uh, and we will excuse current actions based on their prior actions. So what do I mean? So if there is a current uh, racially motivated action, 
Um, and, and I think where this really comes up right now is we have the whole, you know, police brutality and discrimination against black people. We will look back at a George Washington, at a Thomas Jefferson and say, hey, these guys are heroes. Like these are people that we revere and we hold up as the standard. Yeah, they, they, they were slave holders and they may have had sexual intercourse with underage women that were enslaved by them. But that doesn't take away from the fact that they are great men. And what that translates to today is, hey, our police are heroes. They do great things. So if every once in a while they, they, they shoot a black person or whatever, look, that's not, our police are great. Like, what, I just think that that's a, we need to address that in a different way. I think that, um, and so what I, what I wanted to do in, in writing that article is say, our founding fathers uh, of the country created or helped create uh, probably what is to become the freest um, country that there is based on the greatest principles, right? Of freedom, liberty, and justice for all. They were developing at that time a path toward a more perfect union. And I think we're still heading that way. If we um, worship these founding fathers as perfect um, and we deify them, then we're really doing a great disservice to um, our real history and what we've seen. So, so Thomas Jefferson, I think I included this in the article. There were a couple of drafts, mm -hmm. but Thomas Jefferson um, had uh, a, a person who he enslaved, Sally Hemings, um, from a young age. And they began, from everything I've read, they began to have sexual intercourse when she was 14 and he was 40, maybe sometime around that. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're enslaved, you can't- 40, really 44 give, is what you've got written here. Oh, 44, okay. Uh, when you're enslaved, you can't really give consent, right? Um, at the same time, it, they had several children together, at least five, I think six. Um, and you can go to the um, Thomas Jefferson- to the family website where they have all the information in Monticello, et cetera. Um, and so it looks like for, a, for much of their lives, they almost lived as a married couple and they raised children together. And she lived in you know, the president's residence and those different things. So I think that we do a disservice to so many people by either deifying Thomas Jefferson or by making him the worst person alive. When I think we need to realize, look, all of us make mistakes. We, uh, we do good things. We do bad things. And, and, so the founding fathers were very important, great people, but they weren't perfect. So we can't deify them and excuse all of the, the mistakes that they made. Seems like you wrote this also during a time, especially this was well, a couple months ago, but where a lot of the, uh, the issues about the statues was going on. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Did that, did that have anything so, to do with it? Uh, probably, I'm sure it did. I'm sure it influenced. I didn't, I, I didn't intentionally go out and say, okay, I want to, I want to write this so that we, you yeah. know, Contribute what, to this, what, is your, think, what is your opinion on that? On the yeah, statue? So, so if you want to talk about statues of Confederate generals, if you look at when those were put up, um, most of those were put up in the 19, early 1900s, 1910s, and then in the 1950s and 1960s. And so these were put up in direct response to two court cases. One was Plessy v. Ferguson that was the separate but equal that said, sorry, you got to treat black people equally. That means giving them the equal right to vote. And so many of these Confederate statutes were put up in courthouses, voting places, et cetera, to say, hey, you may think they may, those federal courts may say this, but you just so you know, we still live a certain life down here and you're not going to vote. Uh, same thing, 1950s and 60s, it was the um, Brown versus Board of Education, desegregate schools, treat black people equally. These statutes were put up to terrorize black people, to pre prevent them from voting, to let them know that they weren't equal, separate or, or, or integrated. They were not equal. For those, if we are um, putting up those statues to purposefully uh, terrorize and scare black people, um, they, they should be taken down. Whether they're put in a museum, whether they're whatever, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that we should have black people or anybody else go on the streets and tear them down, but they should be taken down. If we have statues put up, the, the, the Jefferson Memorial, uh, the Washington Memo Monument, right? Let's talk about these. Let's have a conversation. These statues and monuments were not put up as a celebration of slavery, as a celebration of, of segregation or white superiority or any of that. They were put up to celebrate these men um, playing a foundational role in the United States of America, which whether you 
your own personal beliefs or it's the greatest place ever or not, it certainly is um, unique in its calls for freedom, liberty, and justice for all. And, um, and, you, and, and I think you would have to agree is at least one of the, the, the greatest, if not the greatest countries in the world. And so, I, so, so how do I feel about the statues? The Confederate statues that are put up, I don't think they should be, especially not on public spaces, public properties. I, I don't think they should be there. The other statues of uh, founding fathers, other people that may be seen as heroes, um, I think there needs to be a conversation had if, if uh, and, and so when we're celebrating Thomas Jefferson, there needs to be a conversation had about what happened with Sally Hemings and about slavery. And we need to talk about how things have changed and how um, maybe some things were acceptable before by some people and they're not, but there needs to be a more thorough story told. Do these monuments need to come down? Do we need to, um, do we need to take down the Washington Monument or the Jefferson Memorial? I don't think that's necessary, but I haven't been a, par a part of the full conversation, but there should be some conversation had um, about each of these statues and each of these people and whether it's creating another statue to tell, oh, this is how he changed or how she changed, or these are how, um, you know, here are some of the things they taught that are not accurate and this other person stands up for this freedom and liberty and justice for all. I think there are many alternatives that just need to be discussed and that it needs to be, a, um, these need to be decisions that are, that are made in, in a thoughtful process where everybody contributes to it. Yeah. I see a, a very clear line between the Confederate statues and the others. I do too. Uh, I think, I think, uh, uh, you know, I've, 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 I've kind of gone back and forth with the Confederate statues because there's always that concern about, you know, scope creep. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that, and I have no ties to the South. I, you know, maybe people that have more ties to the South there, that that's a bigger deal to them. You know, it's more. And part not everybody who, and, here, and here's the deal, not everybody who, who, who loves the Confederate statues or the um, Confederate flag not everybody who has a great reverence and respect and love for those is, is and not, let me not say not everybody, many people are not these racist, hateful people, but they see them differently than many other people see them. Yeah, and, that's, and, that's, and that's an issue with having what is the great American experiment, right? I mean, it's like we have a bunch of different types of people trying to get along and, and coming to a consensus, at least a partial consensus in different issues you know, when, when you've got a completely different lived experience, you've got a different background and, you know, it's not easy. This is not an easy thing to do. It's a lot easier to go to countries where, you know, it's, it's mostly one type of person with the same heritage, the ancestors that have lived there forever. It's, that's very different. We have, we have a, I think as Americans, we have a much higher calling here to try and make all of this work. And I agree. And I, and I think it's working out about, about what I, what I call relational covenant. You know, we're, we're all given different gifts and different weaknesses. And to me, you know, I'm getting into the church stuff here a little bit, but, but to me, this is, this is part of the plan. And, 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 and you have to learn to work with it from both sides. If you've been given a gift in something, call it a privilege, a spiritual gift, uh, an advantage, whatever it is, you have a responsibility to share that, right? This is the, the, the parable of the talents. And, and on the other end, if you, if you are weak in something, right? If I'm, if I'm weak in, in, in knowledge or, or um, whatever it might be, you know, I, I, I in basketball, I, I, it's my responsibility to reach up. Right, I, I need to be able to reach up and 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 try and make that work and 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 have a covenant there among people. And it's just it's it's a to me it's very Christian to look at that. I think that's what charity is all about on both ends. And 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 why America is somewhere that's very unique in, in that regard. But it's not it's not the easy route to take. Absolutely. So I, uh, I'll tie this in a little bit to um, diversity and inclusion principles. And that is uh, Verna Myers, who's a diversity and inclusion veteran. She said, diversity is like inviting someone to the party and inclusion is like asking them to dance, right? A lot of companies and, and other organizations are, uncomfortable, are comfortable having 
people in the same place, but you have your wallflowers that, that are not going to come out and dance and people you're in the same place. And sometimes that can actually create more tension. I think you mentioned earlier, more police, more interactions with people can create more friction. It can. One of the theories that I um, subscribe to, it's called intergroup contact theory, which means, you know, like intercollegiate athletics. We so have intergroup contact, intergroup theory? contact theory, which, which posits that if you have someone from an, a quote unquote other group and you have interactions with them on an equal social level, that often your, your biases towards that group will decrease. And so I really do believe that, that we need to have more interactions with people we see as other, whether it's other race, ethnicity, religion, um, from a certain place, speak a different language, whatever it is. If we have more equal interactions on a social level, we will see that person as a human being and see how much more we have in common with each other than see them as that person. I think this is one of the reasons why biases towards those who identify as LGBTQ have decreased so much more than other biases is that this uh, being uh, identifying as LGBTQ, IA plus, um, or any of those um, is not immediately identifiable in many circumstances. And so you can find a person and say, oh, that's my friend, Jill, who happens to be, uh, who happens to identify as lesbian, rather than saying, hey, there's that lesbian. So you're identifying a human being who happens to identify as something rather than identifying someone as a category and categorizing them, kind of like we talked about earlier, the identity politics. But when we can do that, uh, when we can follow intergroup racial, uh, excuse me, intergroup contact, then we can have equal, um, have more experience with people on an equal social level. So if you ever go to these work retreats where you play these goofy games together and you do all these things, you're having contact with others on an equal social level. Then all of a sudden, I become Tim, who's a, a married father of five, who is from California, who, you know, whatever different things. And I'm not, well, that's the black guy that's going to come and talk about this. It's because now I become a human being. And the more we can um, treat people as human beings rather than dehumanizing them or categorizing them, the more we can come together. I agree 100%. And I was just um, part of a training with BYU Law School that Thomas Griffith was on. And he's a um, federal court judge over at the, um, at the federal circuit in D.C. And he said, coming to religion, talking about both BYU and about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we should be the most diverse group that there is out there. It shouldn't even be close. Our, both our reach because of missionaries and members around the world, but also the inspiration and the gifts that we've been given, language-wise, culture-wise, opportunity-wise, we should be able to build more bridges than anyone else out there. Uh, and I see that happening in many ways. We're behind the ball in a lot of ways. And in some ways we're resisting because I think we're just not communicating well. But in many ways, we really are. I think of President Nelson linking arms with the leadership from the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, right? NAACP. These are ways that we can really build great bridges and relationships that, that eliminate a lot of the prejudices and issues out there. I've been on phone calls and in other meetings with um, African-American leaders from around the country, and they know about our church and they know about the things that our church is doing with the NAACP, and that's a big deal. So absolutely, I agree, not only as a Christian, but even more so uh, for me as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I feel like we have opportunities to build bridges and a responsibility to do that. Often when we have these conversations about race, diversity, et cetera, we look at blame and we look at fault, and those are big distracting principles. When we're so focused on blame and fault, Nobody wants to take responsibility. You say, oh, it's not my fault. I didn't cause it. Uh, one philosophy I try to follow is regardless of who caused it, and sometimes we do need to know the causation in order to properly address it. But one um, philosophy I follow is regardless of who caused it, we all have an opportunity to do something about it. We all have a responsibility. So my wife and I saw this play out a few years ago. We used to always with our kids, you know, whose bowl is that on the table? Who left this? Who did that? And, and we never, I don't think I ever had one kid ever say, oh, dad, that was me. I'll clean it up. Like ever, I don't think we ever had that. But when we changed our philosophy, instead we'd argue for 10 minutes about who did it and we wouldn't fix it. When we changed our philosophy to just say, hey, Grace, or hey, Dallin, would you pick that cup up? At first they were saying, but I can do it. And we'd say, that's okay. Would you pick it up and put it in the sink for me anyway? Well, we've done that more and more in our family now to where we say, will you put that in the sink? Yeah, I'll do that. 
I think if we could bring that theory into when we talk about policing, when we talk about whatever we talk about, to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm less interested in who's to blame and who's at fault and more interested in what we can do to, to, to move things forward. I think that we'll be much in a much better position to move things forward. Yeah, that's a good point. Going into the church then, fine, and, and, and we'll, we'll finalize our interview here on this, but where are we now at with race relations within the church? I mean, you talk about the NAA, NAACP, um, I, there's more and more that I see on social media, more diversity, more African Americans. You have the really the amazing growth of the church in Africa. Um, where do we stand now with this? Yeah, I think it's uh, the church is in a <laughs> it spans the spectrum. I guess I should say. I think when the when we look at the leadership um, of the church, the, the first presidency and the quorum of the twelve apostles. They really seem to be tuned in and focused and aware of a lot of diversity issues and addressing them. I think they may have far more experience with those uh, members of the church that are not, you know, in Utah and Arizona and and kind of some of the Idaho, the strongholds of the church. They, uh, I, I don't know if most members of the church know that there are more members of the church outside of the United States and inside the United States. I don't know if most of us know the high number of African saints or saints down in Brazil and South America. I think that many of the leadership and the, you know, the first presidency and the quorum of the 12 apostles have much more experience with people that are um, different racially, ethically, et cetera, that they see those on a daily basis and address those on a daily basis. I think most members of our church that we interact with, especially on social media, Arizona, Utah, other um, conservative states, not a lot of diversity, um, might not see race at all, again, because they don't there are hardly any minorities or diverse people in their wards. And so when someone says, Hey, there's a race problem, they say, why are you trying to create problems? We don't see any problems. And I've seen, you know, one of the, for me, one of the most sad and heartbreaking things about the recent social justice movement has been to see members of our church um, attack those calling for equal treatment of others. Like that's been the, one of the saddest things. I'm also saddened when we have members of our church that are, um, politically to the left that say that all police are racist and evil. That makes me sad too. I'm not taking one side or another. Both of those really break my heart. It's been heartbreaking for me to see people that I consider friends, people that are in my stake and ward family, um, either post memes that attack black people or others, or, or just post um, mean things. And that's been a challenge. So where is the church? I think um, we're moving in a great direction. I think that um, we've got some challenges to face, right? As far as some of the statements made by prior church leaders um, that, that need to be addressed. I often wonder how many of our church members, so, so, so you know, unfortunately, we, our church, some of the leaders taught some incorrect principles based on race over the history of our church. Um, the church has disavowed those teachings and said that they are incorrect and condemns you know, some of the principles behind like condemns racism, et cetera. But I bet that not 10% of our church members have read the church's official statement on race in the priesthood that teaches a thorough, a, a fairly thorough history of race in the church. Are at least about the essay? Comes, yeah, the essay. Mm -hmm. um, I bet fewer than 10% of our members have read it. And for many that have read it, I've heard, well, that's just the church trying to be politically correct. That's not doctrine. That's being politically correct. And that's a concern for me. Um, and I think we need to address it. Uh, I've heard people suggest perhaps it needs to be read in its entirety at general conference. And I wouldn't object to that. I, we need something so that people understand, hey, the, the theories that were taught about race, about black people being inferior, whether it's pre-mortal existence or whatever, those were wrong. We not only disavow them, we say that they're wrong and that we are all equal. I think that that, um, I think we could go a long way by doing that. I also think that that's just a tough principle because for a lot of people, and this kind of relates to the article about the founding fathers, a lot of people think that, well, these guys were perfect or they try to deify prophets, right? The prophets are not perfect. They make mistakes like everyone else. God doesn't take away our agency just because he uses us, thankfully, right? God has such a respect for our agency that he will allow us to make mistakes. Even he allows prophets to make mistakes, but he empowers them and strengthens them to overcome those mistakes and move on. 
Is it in everyone's vision? Maybe not. Is it in this life? Maybe not. Uh, but this is one of the issues that I think we could do a better job of learning is that good people make mistakes and that's part of the plan of salvation and we can overcome those, but we do need to address them so that we avoid those mistakes in the future. So I think the church is moving forward in many great ways and leaps and bounds. And I think it will continue to move forward as all of us become more familiar with what the brethren are currently teaching today. Do you, do you think that the, let's call it the, uh, well, do you think that the black membership of the church believes that in, in, in let's just say in the West in the United States? Um, I think it's divided. I think it's divided. Um, for many black members of the church, they feel unseen. Um, they, they see on social media, many of their brothers and sisters taking, taking shots at black people, uh, not, sh- not physical gunshots, I'm sorry, taking, um, making negative statements, harmful, hateful statements about them, and they feel excluded. And when they want to bring those... So, so let, me, let me just bring this up. So this is another one of those things where I, I, I've never seen this. I've just never seen this. But, so you're saying that there are members of the church that are, that are saying disparaging remarks about black members of the church or about black people? General? About black people in general, and in, in general, yeah, you'll you'll see that on social media quite a bit, and, and 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 let me tell you, it mostly falls along political lines, and that's the sad part is that I often ask people, what what are you first? Are you white first, or are you a Christian first? Are you black first, or are you a Christian first? Are you uh, gay first, or a Christian first? Are you straight first, or are you Christian first? And so many people, I think, identify as I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, who happens to also have this value, but they. They, they will follow President Trump or whatever, or Barack Obama or Nancy um, Pelosi or whoever before they'll follow, follow President Nelson. And I think we can't, we can't, we can't do that. So uh, people who are not familiar in the church might not know that it's not 20, 30 years ago that you have to look back to church members calling black people the N-word. It still happens often. I have friends that, <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of Sisters in Zion the, who have yes, this book. Yeah, yeah um, I, I know who they are. But I interact with one of them on social media. Um, and I think it was last year. I, one of them said, you know, it, it was last year in the temple that I was called the N-word in the temple. I thought, you know, we, we just need to address it. We need to address it. We don't need to vilify the people that did it, but we need to teach it in a way that people understand that that's completely yeah. unacceptable. They seem like nice, nice lady. They are a little bit political though. <laughs> they are. I, no, I agree. I agree. And I, and I think of unapologetically. Um, and, and I think they, uh, anyways, I, I, I like that we can have a conversation and everybody doesn't have to be the same in having a conversation. We can have different opinions, but I like that we can have the conversation. And that's one of my issues, Tim, with, with just identity politics, period, as, as I say that, is, is I don't like the idea of, you know, going out and identifying yourself first with a group before you would, like you said, identify yourself as a Christian. So I think, I think you can say that politically, but you can also say that you know, about your sexual orientation. You can say that about your skin color, uh, your race. You know, it, it's, it, it's interesting. Have you seen the, uh, the, 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 it's not really a talk or a presentation or a fireside, something that Elder Bednar gave a few years ago. Which one? And it was talking about um, gay members of the church. And he said I something that's remember. pretty controversial, but he kind of explained it afterward. And he said, there are no gay members of the church. Right. And you say, well, wait a minute here. That, what is he saying? You know, is he denying something? It, and he's not. But if you go and you listen to what he's saying, he says, it's like that exact thing. He says, look, the most important thing is that, number one, our identity is that we're all children of God. Right. And, and right. so we don't want to just say, you know, we don't want to go in and try and focus on a gay member of the church even though they have a different experience and a different background, the primary issue is, or the primary identifi- identifier is they are members of the church, right? They're, they're, they're children of God. They are in the same predicament we all are, right? No matter who you are, you are in a fallen state. And no matter who you are, you need a redeemer. Absolutely. Right? And, and I think that, I think that, for me, the issue on a lot of this is, and, and maybe it's just a process we all have to go through. It, maybe it's just the way it is. But, but holding that up higher, we are all children of God. We are all created in the image of God. We are all sinners. We're all in a fallen state. We're all in the same boat. You know, we're all in the same boat. We're all, we're, we're, we all need a Redeemer. And Absolutely. if we could put that first... Right. In our idea of in our image of each other, you know, is, you know, as Victor Hugo says, you know, I mean, 
um, see each other through the eyes of God. You know, I, I think that's that that's the, the most important thing. That's the goal. And I think what we want to do is to be able to see each other through the eyes of God. And if we have, um, and, and if we have, for example, we talked earlier about many times white people don't have to see race because they walk in and they see people who looks like them. They see the foods that they eat, et cetera. And black people have a different experience. The goal is not for black people to have a better experience. I think I've heard it explained a lot of times. Uh, uh, black Lives Matter, and I'm not commenting on the organization because I've studied it and I, 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 I'm not commenting on the organization, but the movement is not saying black lives matter more. It's saying black lives matter also too. And I think that if we could change that conversation, then that will help us to have some insight in the church to say, we are all equal. Yes. In theory. So then let's work to make sure that everyone's treated equally, right? We should all be equally invested to make sure that everyone's treated equally, regardless if they are from our political affiliation or not, right? The the quote unquote good Samaritan, which I had this kind of awakening about a month ago to think, boy, there's probably more than one good Samaritan, right? I know we, <laughs> the Jews and Samaritans didn't get along, but even just saying the good Samaritan has a negative connotations for all other uh, Samaritans, right? But the principle behind the story is regardless of our religious, political, other affiliation, we should rise up to serve others. We should follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. And it may be that I'm not being discriminated against, but I need to speak up for others. I, I will use my, and, and I think the term privilege is, is, a, is a hot term right now because it can be used to, de, to discriminate or to describe something in a way that's offensive. But if I have opportunities or privileges to do something, I should speak up for others who maybe don't have the voice to do that, even though I'm not discriminating. And so I've, I've been in church leadership for a long time. I'm not going to hear some of the same negative things that other black members of the church do. That's often not going to be my experience. Uh, I don't have to worry about some people not listening to me. I'm going to be listened to and heard because of my leadership position. But for those who don't have that position, um, maybe their um, concerns or experiences aren't going to be heard. So I agree 100%. We should identify first as children of God, both ourselves and others. And so if we identify someone else as black, white, Republican, gay, whatever, and we think of that before we think of them as a child of God, that's going to color how we treat them. But if we can see them as the child of God that they are, if we can see them through God's eyes, uh, we will be inspired with ways to connect with them. And we will, um, I think, see how similar we are. And we will build bridge, bridges that bring us together. Appreciate that. Hey, is there anything else you wanted to bring up? I'm grateful for the time. No, I'm grateful for the time to talk to you. I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to have a conversation about these, I think, very important topics. And I hope we will have more of these conversations, not, not we, meaning me and you, although, of course, I'd love to talk to you. Sure, again. sure. I hope more of us will say, yeah, you know what? We need to brush aside a lot of the political things that, that set us apart and see how we can come together. And we can agree to disagree on some things, and that's okay because we see things differently. So I, you know, I, I'm sure 10 minutes from now I'm going to look back and say, oh, I should have said this. But I think uh, I, I just really do appreciate this opportunity to connect, to talk about challenging topics. And I hope that anyone who's, who's listened or, or seen this can see that there are lots of varying perspectives. I, I don't think anyone's, you know, we're doing good guy, bad guy, good, evil, et cetera, but that we have different experiences. And as we share those with each other, we'll find a lot of common ground. Yeah, I agree. hundred percent. Let me applaud you for the disarming nature of this, of this show is that because it's a disarmed conversation, we can have it. And I feel safe to have it. Right. If we can't have a disarming conversation, then we're not going to have one. Well, that's the idea of the adversary is to stir everybody up and on different sides. <laughs> that's it. Well, I appreciate you, Greg. I really do. Yeah. Hey, I appreciate you too. Now, did you grow up a UCLA fan? I did. I grew up, uh, my brother and I would ride our bicycles down to the Rose Bowl. You know, it's just free a lot of security and play around over there at the Rose Bowl. Awesome. So I'm, I'm a Bruce fan, so. <laughs> Go Bruce. My, my, my dad went to law school there at UCLA and uh, grew up just not too far away from there, so. Nice. Yeah, fun stuff. Love Pasadena. All right, Tim, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.